Welcome back guys to episode two of our turbo manifold fabrication. We just wrapped this thing up last night and it came out awesome. I'm sure you guys can see it lurking in the background. I'm really excited with it. This was an awesome process to learn. I had a lot of fun doing it. Khalil was around and lent a huge hand. This would have taken forever otherwise, but we knocked the whole thing out in one really long day. And I'm excited to show you guys exactly how every step of the process went. I think you guys might learn something. I'll also say before we dive in, we just hit 50,000 subscribers. That's an awesome milestone to me. I don't know how to say thank you guys enough. I'm thrilled that so many of you guys are enjoying this project. I literally turned off. Apparently soccer games are more important, huh, Khalil? Yes, sorry. Europa League final. <laughs> I don't know who that is, but anyways. If you haven't subscribed yet and you are enjoying the content and you want to follow along in this build, do so. It'll help my channel grow and it makes all the hard work that goes into these episodes worth it. All right, let me show you guys how we actually built this turbo manifold. So the first order of business for the day was to get the 308 spun around. Obviously we're working on the back of the car and this project's gonna require a lot of back and forth trips to the bandsaw, to the fab table, and to the welder. So this is gonna make things a lot easier for me. The second thing to do is to spend about 30 minutes getting your turbo and collector right where you want them and then remembering you forgot to bevel the edges of it. So remove your collector, bevel those edges for fabrication, and then spend another 30 minutes getting the entire thing set up just right once again. At least that's how I did it. You can choose to change that method if you want to. In the last episode, I'll show you guys the materials that we are using, but to reiterate, this stuff is all one and a half inch Schedule 10 Vibrant Performance 304 stainless steel. This whole project is kind of like building with only four Lego pieces, although we can cut and modify them as we need to. The first piece available to us is a 90 degree bend, and it's on a two and a quarter inch radius. This is known as the large radius 90. The second piece, is pretty much the exact same thing, although it's pre-cut to 45 degrees that you see here. The real advantage is that it can save some time cutting, but the real MVP is the third piece. This is a tight radius 90 degree bend, and we're gonna use a lot of these to get this job done. The benefit here is that it allows a much tighter bend in getting your tubes positioned where you want. Last, we've got a straight tube, which is pretty self-explanatory. Now, as for how this whole process goes, it's a lot of repetition. There's basically cutting and fitting, and then there's cutting and fitting. The process basically requires putting our tube work in the engine bay and taking a rough guess at the changes we wanna make, heading over the bandsaw and making some changes. Cutting this stuff in the bandsaw is a pretty slow and steady process. Being Schedule 10 pipe, it is a slow cut. It requires a lot of patience, but eventually you'll make it through. Following cutting it, it's gotta be taken over to the belt grinder and have the edges cleaned up. At this time, if you know your tube is correct, you can bevel the edge of it too, because everything needs to get beveled for welding. The demands placed on the manifold are quite extreme, so we're gonna need absolute full penetration on these welds. Then it's back to the car for another test fit. Any changes you wanna make, make those, rinse and repeat over and over and over again until you finally get to your destination. The last small leg on our first primary is straight. So to simplify this one, we're gonna use the falling bandsaw that I bought recently. Turns out this thing was worth the 70 bucks or so that it cost me because it cuts dead nuts straight. Quite the score. The benefit to a falling bandsaw is that we can set up our cut and simply walk away. Gravity will do the rest of the work. So while I started working on the next piece of metal, this saw cut this piece off nice and straight. You guys can see here that we're getting really close, or in fact, we're actually there. But it's important to note that when building these primaries, the fitment has to be absolutely perfect. There can't be any gaps because we are TIG welding this and it needs to be precise. Once I got it lined up, I had Khalil lean into the bay and make some indexing marks on the tube so that I could remove it and weld it up on the workbench. It's important to put different marks between each tube so that you can identify what order the pieces go in on the workbench. Otherwise, you'll wind up spending 45 minutes or so trying to figure out how the last tube of the night goes together because it's made of eight different pieces. Ask me how I know. So 
for now we're just tacking everything up because we might want to make some changes but also because everything needs to be purged when we go to weld it and that'll happen well after we get all of the tube work done. I did tack the first primary to the collector to ensure that the collector and the turbo will not move while I'm building the rest of the primaries, but we will be cutting the primaries off of the collector and the flange to weld them completely before we finish this. Moving on to the second primary, it was relatively simple because this thing is pretty close to symmetric. It was a matter of kind of copying what we had for the first one and building some repeat parts, making some minor adjustment changes as I went. It is immensely satisfying when the pieces finally fall into place and fit just the way you were hoping they would. With that, primary two is ready for tack welding. like a glove. All right, so I've got two primaries done. I like to imagine that they're the two difficult ones, but I don't know, we're gonna find out in pretty short order. But I have to say, I'm pretty happy with how they're coming out. It's a bit more challenging than I expected this to be. I've done a decent bit of work with kind of normal stainless tubing that has legs on it, and without legs to work with, you are really kind of limited in how you can kind of run from one point to another, requires more pieces to do it. But I think some of that experience has helped. And like I said, it's coming out pretty well. It's not perfectly symmetric, but that wasn't ever something I was anticipating. I think it looks pretty good. So on to the next two, let's get them done. I decided right off the bat that I wanted to add some complexity to this project by making the two center primaries cross over one another. This will make them a bit closer to being equal in length, although I'm not too concerned about it. But this really up the ante in terms of the complexity for this, and I want to illustrate why. Tubes can only rotate on a single axis, just like this. You can see just how much the end of the straight tube moves when I move the 45 just a little bit. And this compounds once you start adding multiple bends. You can see here how that might work. Now the other thing at hand is that we can only work with the radius of the bends that we have. We can't make the tubes bend any tighter or more broad than the tools that we're given. So it adds a degree of complexity when trying to make one end of the tube meet somewhere else in 3D space. With that in mind, the third primary came together relatively quickly. It wasn't long before it was fitted in place and I had Khalil making marks so that we could bevel all of these edges once again tack this thing up and actually try fitting three primaries at once. Three in place look pretty sweet but we quickly ran into oh, a problem. It's looking tight. Oh no. Touching? Yeah. I don't think that it's actually doable. Yeah, it can't like exist at the correct angle. It's like gotta go pointed. Uh, then you gotta move that bend if you wanna do. And I was so confident that that would work. Yeah. I, didn't, I guess I didn't think about this one being in the way. So, in order for that to work... Could you rotate this more? Well, this piece has to get longer, the base piece. Yeah. And then this bend has to get more bend to it. That needs more bend, and this needs to be shorter and further that way. So I scrapped this plan and changed pads completely. Yeah. I junked the third primary that we had just finished and started over once again. I wanted to retain the idea of crossing the two middle primaries over, but executing that idea turned into a bit of a slog. It was a lot of test fitting and a lot of starting over to ensure that both of them could fit in the engine bay the way that I wanted them to. I wanted to aim for a bit of symmetry between the two. I didn't want one to look more twisted than the other. 
and I wanted to keep everything as close to equal length as I could, although we will touch upon that more later in the episode. We probably could have called it a night by this point and saved the rest for the next day, but I really wanted to push through and get this thing done in a single run. All right, it's a little bit before midnight. It has been an all day thrash, but Khalil and I are here at the shop and we just put the last primary into the car. Got to finally step back and see all four of them in place. We haven't even gotten to see them because they're just kind of hanging out and have to go in one at a time, but they're in. I gotta say, I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited about it. It looks really good. It looks nice. It's simple, but elegant. Hopefully it, hopefully it still looks good after it gets welded, but um, whatever. I'll show you guys. Check this out. All right. It's the next day, we're back in the shop. I need to get some sleep. I know we didn't take a really great look at the manifold last night, so let's actually dive in. Let's talk a little bit about turbo manifold theory, why I've made some of the decisions that I've made. I know there's gonna be quite a few questions about it. I'm not a turbo manifold expert by any measure, but I have turned to those that I trust most when making the decisions about how to design this thing, and I think they've led me down the right path. I'm pretty excited about how this is turning out. There's still the question of how it will look once it's welded up, but that's nothing that like some Cerakote or something can't fix. I think this thing finished in white once we're all said and done will look sweet and very true to kind of some of the old Ferrari and old motorsport headers, things like that. But we'll see. Let's actually take a look at this thing. I mentioned in the last episode that my turbo placement was primarily to keep the center of gravity of the car low and so that I can have a very straight shot of exhaust gases into the turbo. We don't need the turbo manifold being any more complex than it needs to be. And given the fact that we don't have an engine bay constraining us, it seemed pretty obvious to place the turbo right where I did. And I'm happy with the result. These primaries are all quite free flowing, even considering the bends in the middle too. In contrast to a normal four cylinder turbo manifold, I like to think this one's gonna flow a whole lot better, especially considering it doesn't double over itself like most seem to. Now I know plenty of you guys will ask, and I mentioned that we talk about equal length primaries for this manifold. Now I spent some time to get them relatively close, but mostly as a fabrication exercise and to give myself a bit of a challenge. However, for a four to one turbo manifold like this, equal length primaries more or less don't matter. We're not gonna see any advantage from this, unlike we would on a naturally aspirated header where there's a lot more scavenging of exhaust gases. It's important to note that we're only using a single scroll turbo, not a twin scroll. So the equal length primaries here are just for show. On top of that, we should talk about sequential firing order or what order the primaries enter the collector itself. If we number our cylinders, we've got cylinder one, two, three, and four. And the firing order would be one, four, three, and two. And ideally you would have those enter the collector in the firing order radially. So cylinders one, four, three, and then two down here. You would do that on an NA collector, but for a turbo manifold, it really doesn't matter. It's not something that's gonna affect performance and it doesn't really have a measurable effect in one of these situations. Now, I also think we're gonna to need to build some form of support for the turbo so that it doesn't sag. It is a lot of weight and it's on a really long kind of lever arm, so to speak, with that turbo hanging out there. So what I think we're gonna use is some rod ends kind of like this one and build a support that will hold the weight of the turbo while also letting the manifold kind of expand and contract as it gets hot and cools down. So that way, the manifold is able to move around and it can move as the engine moves, but it will never actually be supporting the weight of the turbo itself. I think something like this, where it's hanging from this cross member down to a brace tied into the top of the turbo. With that, episode two of our turbo manifold fabrication is a wrap. I think we've made some really good progress, but we've still got quite a bit more to do. We've got at least one more episode coming. I've got to weld the entire thing up. We've got to do our wastegate, and we need to make that mount on top of the manifold itself. Probably some other things in there as well. But this is some good progress, I'm excited about it. I hope you guys have been enjoying it. I appreciate you guys watching. As always, thank you for all of the support. I will catch you guys on Tuesday's episode.